Welcome to the stage, co-founder and executive director of the Center of Humane Technology, Tristan Harris, and game theorist and filmmaker, Liv Burry. I think what we wanted to kind of use this time together really interactively, I mean, we don't have, to, we have a rough plan of things we want to talk about, but is just how do we get better at pointing our attention, not at bad guys, at the bad CEOs, at the bad corporations, which there are bad CEOs and bad corporations, but notice bad games. Can we point our attention at a bad game and see that as the kind of deeper structure underneath why many problems are kind of getting worse? Because that's, I think, been a big transformation for us in both of our lives. And you can speak to it first. I'm happy to speak to my experience with how I started seeing that with social media. Yeah, I mean... I think the first time I sort of noticed uh, these kind of dynamics emerging in my own life was when, you know, you're playing a game of poker and everyone agrees, you know, the, the reason the game works is that everyone is in agreement of what the rules are and what, what are, is allowed to be done versus isn't allowed to be done. Um, and when people, well, what I noticed with, with, uh, with poker, when I first got into it, you know, it was very much a game of, it was like an art more than anything. No one knew, understood the mechanics of the game specifically. And the best players in the world were like very intuitive, uh, kind of like hustler people who were just playing on their street smarts. But through the march of technology, um, when we then like got online poker and um, the ability to like, uh, save your hands in digital format after a big playing session. It created the incentive for everyone to start building uh, software like that could analyze analyze um, analyze all of uh, all of this information, and it created this kind of arms race dynamic where if you didn't uh, use the latest software to to examine your hand histories or to like study the game theoretic optimal uh, solutions, you would get behind, left behind everyone else who did. And at least in poker, this arms race dynamic was by and large, um, you know, in some ways it created bad outcomes because it took away a little bit of the magic of the game. Now it's like, um, you know, it's, it's become very scientific and you, you have to, uh, you don't stand a chance basically if you don't study with it, with uh, these analysis softwares. But overall, the externalities of this competitive situation are fairly limited. But in all of these examples we're going to talk about, like the externalities are strictly negative. And it's this same dynamic of like, a combination of like short-term uh, incentives acting on the individuals that in aggregate are misaligned with the good of the whole. Yeah. And when, so what I hear you saying is like, there's this game of poker and people are developing strategies and there's got one set of people developing good strategies, other people developing good strategies. Suddenly this new group comes along and they're like this AI powered poker player yeah. and they're just doing, they're starting to outcompete everybody else in the field. And so the other guys can't win by just trying to not do the AI power thing. They have to also analyze the data, build a predictive model, get better and better and match them in that power. Whether they want to or not. Whether they want to or not. Yeah. And so it becomes this race to the, to, the, to the bottom, race to the edge, in which we end up playing a game where we, we're not even having maybe fun until then you get to this new phase and you're, you're playing a better game. And I think ultimately what we want to do is get better as societies of noticing these bad games so that we don't spend all of our energy like lobbing against that one po poker player, being upset at him, and instead realize that we need to change the game so that either everybody gets those AI powered poker capacities or, you know, or we, no one gets them or something like that. Uh, another example of this I like is, um, you know, these beauty filters that are on like Instagram and TikTok everywhere, right? Um, has anyone here ever used them, tried them? felt like they no post a picture admit, and then be like, I look really good in this, I'm going to post it. Um, the reason why this is a similar dynamic, um, this Moloch-y dynamic, we haven't explained why it's called Moloch yet, we should do that, but um, is, you know, the, the world of influencing is incredibly competitive these days. It's actually the number one job choice amongst uh, Gen Z, at least in the US and in the, in, in the West. The number one most aspired to career is social media influencer. Right. And what, is the best way of getting likes and follows, it's posting hot pictures. And 
by and large, these beauty filters, you know, for the average brain, we, you know, if you see a side by side, most people's brains tend to click on the one uh, or notice the one that has got these beauty filters on them. So there's this massive incentive pressure for individuals individual social media influencers to use these things, even if they, A, they know they're being a little bit unauthentic to their, to their followers, but also if they know that they, even if they don't like how um, the, the filter makes them feel. Like when I've used these things, I, you know, I'll, I'll post, I'll, I'll, I'll take a picture that I love. Like, I'm like, damn, that's a great picture. And then I'll apply the filter to it and then compare to the original and I no longer like the original picture. And it's horrible for your mental health if you, if you keep doing this continuously. Not to mention if you're like on social media and you're seeing everything and it's you can't tell what's real, what's not, but everyone seems really hot. It's gonna make you feel bad about yourself. But everyone is trapped in this situation where, well, I might as well use them because I know that everybody else is. And if I don't, I'm not gonna be competitive um, against my peers. So yeah, another example of Moloch. And to deepen that example, since um, we do all this work on, on social media, we hear from so many kids who, uh, there's like a teen girl will say, I'm worried my boyfriend will break up with me if I stop using the beautification filter because he's hooked to me based on a false impression of what I look like. And so now to, so go from like, there's these comp you know, there's these people who are caught in a race to add beautification filters. On the social dilemma side, how many people here have seen the Netflix documentary Social Dilemma? Okay, awesome. A bunch of you, awesome. Um, so that's, you know, just to actually give a little backstory on that. Um, so in, in that film, if you remember, in 2013, I was actually at Google and I was starting to notice the tech is going in this worse direction. It's like it seems to be kind of pushing society into this more addicted, outraged, distracted, polarized, validation-seeking society. It's like, what is that? There's this weird invisible force that's kind of pushing in that direction. And I, um, I remember just sitting there and all my friends at, in college, uh, my friends in, um, at Stanford were the co-founders of Instagram and they built these things. And we were all in this lab that we've talked about many times together. Uh, there was a class called the Persuasive Technology Class with BJ Fogg. And we were all learning these techniques about how do you influence people's psychology? And they were building that into the way Instagram worked. And so these apps that when you're talking about the influencers have no choice but to add a beautification filter, well, the apps have to compete also, mirror, mirror on the wall, which of these apps makes me look best of all. If Snapchat adds a beautification filter, TikTok has to follow. And in your video, Liv's done a great video you should all Google later called um, The Beautification Wars or Moloch. Uh, beauty Wars. Beauty yeah. Wars, Beauty Wars. And uh, in your video, you talk about how TikTok was even found to invisibly, be, without even asking people, in, uh, beautify your photo by like less than 5%, 3% or something like that. Because the point is we, again, we prefer the thing that we use that makes us look the best. So that you're talking about it first on the user side, that users are caught in this arms race. Then there's the people making the things. Now can Instagram or Snapchat choose to take away the beautification filters now that they're there? They're just gonna lose to TikTok or, or the other one that keeps adding the beautification filters. So that's where this phrase came up in the presentation that I gave in 2013 to Google that went viral and caused this kind of stir in the company, where the phrase, the race to the bottom of the brainstem, right? It's a race for who can reverse engineer more secret back doors into influencing the human mind. And if you innovate another one called pull to refresh, you're just going to outcompete the guy that doesn't do the pull to refresh slot machine. And if you innovate, like TikTok did, a full screen video takeover where you swipe and it takes over the full screen, the reason why TikTok is winning over Instagram is because Instagram has continuous scrolling where you, you scroll, but then you can kind of keep going between. You can be halfway between one photo and the next one. But TikTok's winning because they created this format that's like, it snaps to take over the entire thing, right? So they're, they're figuring out more and more of the edges and features of the geometry of like what keeps us engaged, but that in net and aggregate, produces this more addicted, distracted, polarized, narcissistic, misinformed society. Um, and I, th I think it's worth mentioning there that it's because the what rewards the companies directly is getting, well, their goal is to generate as much ad revenue. And they get that by maximizing user minutes on there. Um, and you know, people coming back, so in other words, engagement, but engagement is only loosely correlated with what 
is it actually good for people? Like if someone in their highest, wisest self was to be like, what do I want in life? Yes, I want to be entertained and have a nice time. But engagement only partially does that. And in some cases, it's completely decoupled and even inverse from it. You know, it's like the, the, the rats on heroin. Like technically the rat will keep going back and pressing the heroin button because it's um, it feels nice. But, you know, we know and probably if the rat could have a higher mind, it would also be like, I, this is not what I want to be. But it can't stop because it's it's so effective at doing that. And these technologies, you know, we're, they're, they're throwing more and more resources into winning this game, not because they want to turn everybody into zombies, but the nature of the game demands it. So let's also talk about, um, oh shit, I just had a train of thought lapse. Um, uh, I was going to add a couple other ones. So another one is loneliness. We have a massive loneliness and mental health crisis, right? But if I don't maximize engagement, you sitting by yourself on a screen doom scrolling, I'm going to lose the guy that will. So that's this another tragedy of the commons where we get mass loneliness everywhere around the world because everyone is caught in this bad race. Another one is ego pumping. So literally TikTok and Instagram are in a competition for who can promise the, Mac, the most visibility. If you post the same video on Instagram as you do on TikTok, it's a race for who can promise more people will see it. So for example, the way TikTok has won that race is they designed it so it's like um, you scroll really fast through a lot of stuff. So think of it like the number of swipes per hour on TikTok is going to be a lot faster because they engineered it for that just rapid one, 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 which means that the view count for every video, every photo is going to go up a lot faster than on Instagram where people are scrolling more slowly through like a long list of their content. Right? So you start seeing how one design strategy produced way more volume of views. So now the teenager who just posted their video is like, I reached a million people today. But really you reached like half, like this little micro part of their brain for a microsecond. And so this number is ego inflation and they're competing to boost that number. Now the reason, the thing I wanted to say when I lapsed a second ago was the reason all this is important is because it says something about where do you intervene in a system? Is the solution to this problem, let's go to Washington, D.C. and regulate content moderation. Let's regulate this content is good, this content is bad, and if we just got the bad content off of TikTok, Instagram, whatever the thing is, we'd somehow live in this utopia where social media is good for humanity. I want you to see that that reason that that solution is not good is because it doesn't deal with the race dynamic. And so I just wanted to say that because the point of this, I think, for us is to train our attention on how do we solve problems more effectively in the world. And instead of getting upset at one company who is screwing up teens' mental health, like Snapchat is doing a bunch of negative stuff to screw up teen mental health. And we could put all of our energy on that, or we could realize that Snapchat is caught in a bad dynamic, right? And so I think that's maybe a helpful place to then introduce Moloch, which is how do we all get good at slaying Moloch? So what is maybe Moloch? Yeah, well, I'll give you a little bit of the history of where this term Moloch comes from. It's M-O-L-O-C-H, by the way. Um, it's actually from an old Bible story about this. Um, there was this war-obsessed cult in like the Canaanite times, apparently. Um, hopefully they aren't real. Uh, because they were so determined to win wars that they would they started idolizing this, this sort of god demon effigy thing. It looked like a bull um, called Moloch. And they would sacrifice their children, make the ultimate sacrifice, you know, the thing they love the most, their children to this thing, um, in the belief that it would then bestow upon them um, all the military power they could ever want to win wars. And it's sort of from there that it is, you know, in, in more modern terms, has become sort of synonymous with this idea of unhealthy game theory, where the design of the game incentivizes people to sacrifice more and more um, important other values, you know, the things that they hold dear in order to win that short term thing. So, uh, again, like the social media companies sacrificing um, the, mean, the, the social media companies are literally sacrificing our children for a short term gain of yeah. more profit quarterly going up and up yeah. and up. So it's actually quite um, literally that story coming true. Or in like um, a sort of environmental tragedy of the commons type situation. Like it's not like cattle farmers in Brazil necessarily want to destroy the Amazon rainforest, but they are trapped in their own game of like they this is the easiest way to like feed their families, you know, expand their business. Um, they can turn that 
patch of wood into a pile of money um, and then put their, their, their cows on it. And even if they don't want to, they feel like they might as well because the, uh, the farm down the road will just do it as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's this idea of like sacrificing other things in order to optimize for a narrow metric. That's kind of what Moloch does. You know, if Moloch was to have a personality, it's like that brain worm that gets into people and makes them uh, feel like they have no other option um, it, but to, to, to sacrifice the other really important stuff uh, in order to win. Another example of this, there's a great book called Salt, Sugar, Fat. How many people here have heard of that book? Yeah. Well, wow, actually a lot of people. Um, and it really goes through how the food industry, the processed food industry, you know, we, here's one, here's another, another example. You know, you can say we have this obesity crisis. We have uh, obesity crisis, a diabetes crisis, huge, you know, health crisis. And we could say we need to educate people about what they eat. And that's obviously one thing we definitely need to do. We need to have more mass education of people about, about food. But also, what are the driving forces there? These companies are caught in a race to create addictive foods, just like social media companies are raced to create addictive apps. And it turns out that just like narcissism and pull to refresh and, you know, auto um, uh, removing the stopping cues and infinite scroll are the kind of mechanisms of social media being addictive. In food, it's just salt, sugar, fat. It's just more clever combinations of salt, sugar, fat. Those are the back doors to the human gustatory system. And the companies are literally in that book in an arms race to add more and more and more. And it's actually really interesting because the book opens with this famed meeting, I think it was in 1999, where the food scientists and the, uh, the health scientists from the major food companies like Tyson Foods and General Mills, they all got together at a hotel, I think it was in uh, Michigan or Detroit or something. And they, um, they actually acknowledged that there's this collective kind of climate change of bodies <laughs> that's happening from their arms race. And they said, can we coordinate? Can we actually agree to set limits on salt, sugar, and fat. And it was really interesting that actually opening chapter of the book goes into it. We're going to be releasing a podcast episode soon with um, uh, the author of the book. But it's essentially the talks failed because um, the leading company that was most profiting from this said, we're just giving people what they want. And the other companies were only going to agree to something if the leading big company were to change course. Um, but I think it's a really good example of across you know everything you see you know deforestation or climate change or air pollution or obesity or um, you know social media polarization a lot of people here probably work on protecting democracy strengthening democracy how do you do that when it's an arms race to be the best division entrepreneur i can be because the outrage engagement economy rewards me the better i am at identifying a cultural fault line in society and creatively adding inflammation to that fault line and I'm in an arms race to be a better uh, division entrepreneur than the other guy. So you see how the apps competing for that thing then causes people who are now influencers because it's also colonized the meaning of like a future career to also be in that thing. So do you want to add? I think one thing we should sort of double click on as well is because this question often comes up um, is, is Moloch simply capitalism? Or is it something a bit deeper than that? I don't know if you want to. No, you should go ahead. Okay. Um, so my answer to that is it is something much more fundamental than capitalism. Now, obviously, capitalism is as a sort of a system that relies heavily on competition is therefore vulnerable to these kind of um, arms racy dynamics and these these molecky dynamics where it's uh, um, hard for people to coordinate, um, but we need to under but there have been many things that have happened in capitalism that have drastically improved the world as well right so capitalism is a tool that can be used for good or for bad um and that's why it's important to understand that moloch is something deeper than that because it's forces of economics essentially it's forces of game theory um that can manifest and if they are not designed in a conscious you know a smart enough way then they can often become misaligned with the good of the whole yeah um a good example of that is uh, the first you know human tribe or civilization that adopts the plow the a tribe that adopts the plow is going to gain efficiencies and gain extra caloric surplus in a way that they're going to outcompete the other tribes and once they have more surplus, they're going to have more people, they're going to have a bigger population, they're going to have more efficiency, and they get to be more powerful than when there's finite resources. They are the ones that win in that competition against the other tribes. 
And that's before capitalism, right? That's just power advantages. Um, but it's, it goes everywhere. So for example, for those who care about animal rights, well, which civilizations are going to outcompete the others? The ones that see animals as resources to extract the meat and food and, and you know, uh, transport from them, or the ones that see animals as sacred? So you can have values and say animals are sacred, but your society will probably get outcompeted by the society that actually sees animals as resources. And so, um, and it actually can affect culture. Daniel Schmachtenberger, who I'm you know, speaking in his place today, would give the example of, can you have animism and believe that animals are sacred? You could believe that. And then let's imagine the plow comes along, technology changes your society. Now you've got to beat an animal all day long. It's hard to yoke an ox, you know, beat an animal and believe that animals are sacred after that becomes the kind of basis of how your society and civilization works. Then it becomes the new normal. Then people forget. They don't even question whether that's a good thing to do or not. And then you're kind of there again with the same thing with social media. We now like accept it as if it's just part of the fabric of society, but it's just become part of the, the game, the stack of power in, in the Moloch competition. Uh, one thing I think we should uh, dig into a bit as well is the role of AI yeah. in all of this, because, you know, there's the classic um, AI arms race that could potentially be, well, that is playing out, essentially, you know, the race to artificial general intelligence, where again, Arguably, the, the companies that go as fast as possible are, you know, they are, un, they are incentivized to go as fast as possible, even if they know the big picture, it's probably not good for humanity if they go as fast as possible and don't pay attention to safety. At the same time, if they don't do it, then they're going to, you know, they assume they are going to be better stewards of this thing than the, the other company in the other country. Um, so they might as well. And so there's this competitive pressure that makes safety sort of go by the wayside. So there's, there's that manifestation of Moloch in AI. But also the thing about um, AI is that it's, it's an incredibly universal tool. Anything it can be used for, it will be used for, as long as there's the incentive pressures uh, to, to do so. And so as, as you know, we're seeing, we're seeing more and more of these like narrow AIs that are popping up that can be used for all kinds of different industries, different games, essentially. And some of those games are good, which is great. That's why we might be curing cancer in the next 10 years and all these other like wonderful things on the horizon. But some of these games are very bad. Like if, uh, again, individual deforestation company, well, farmers that want to cut down the rainforest now build an AI that help them figure out how to cut it down faster, that would be bad, right? And and for mining and extraction. Now I use AI and satellite imagery and I can do ground penetrating radar with AI I can do better signal detection to figure out how do I do extraction better. Right. So AI will supercharge all of these win lose games on if I don't race to extract the copper from the mines in Chile and forget the externalities, I'm gonna lose to the guy that will, but now AI is going to come in and supercharge every one of these win-lose games, optimizing supply chains, optimizing extraction, optimizing social media for addiction, optimizing a, a fake relationship on social media to be as engaging, flattering, addicting, and you know, sugary, nicotine as possible. Yeah, so we've got about 10 minutes left. I oh, think really? we should, okay. yeah. <laughs> we should um, talk about some examples where we have actually successfully gotten ourselves out of a Moloch-y situation where we've, uh, you know, either redesigned a game um, to make it healthier, or we've all collectively sort of figured out a way to communicate to just stop playing it entirely. Um, you've got a really fun example uh, from Colombia. Yeah. There is this traffic intersection in Bogota uh, where there was like the worst traffic in the world in the, in the city. And um, of course, in that game, if you don't just like keep racing to do the amor amoral, like don't look your past your peripher, you know, keep going as fast as you can. Um, everyone just kind of races to do the micro next short term win for them. So it's just the worst traffic intersection in the world. And the mayor of Bogota was sitting there figuring out how am I going to solve this problem? How do I create coordination? Coordination is the answer to Moloch. How do we coordinate a collectively better game, a better outcome for all of us to play? But he found this really creative solution, which is he hired a bunch of mimes. Mimes like, you know, not talking and making fun of the situation. So when someone would kind of inch their car or like, you know, take a, a weird turn around someone, they would, they would scoot behind the car and kind of make fun of them. Uh, and when someone was jaywalking, they would do something funny kind of behind the jaywalking person. And so everyone went from this kind of ruthless, Moloch-y mindset of like, I just need to get my thing and I need to get where I'm going 
to suddenly it conjugated the experience into a more expansive place of like we're laughing with each other about how we move through this space. Because there's like a thing, right? When the, traffic acts, when the traffic gets worse, people get more and more and more malaki. Like, I'm just damn tired of sitting in this traffic. So I'm going to keep doing that amoral thing. And he figured out, how do I get this traffic intersection to play a different game? So I think it's a really beautiful example. Yeah, that, uh, it's almost like sh showing people a way to transcend. Yes. You know, just through humor is a very good way of people to, to, to not take a situation so seriously, you know, like some cutthroat game. If you can just have that moment of taking a breath, stepping outside and looking at it and going, huh, that's actually kind of ridiculous what we're all doing. That's, that gives people a chance. The, I mean, the other way you can obviously get people um, to sort of wake up is, is through shaming, right? Um, and I think there is some value sometimes to sort of naming and shaming when someone you know very clearly uh, are you familiar with the term prisoner's dilemma um yeah so you know essentially what moloch is is a multi-way prisoner's dilemma the, the classic instantiation is just two people um you know and they'd be better off if they cooperate um but because of in individual incentives in the short term you know from an individual perspective it's better to defect um and what moloch is is basically that but scaled over hundreds or thousands of people um what was i going to say uh <laughs> I mean, I can give another example that for a long time in interpersonal relationships, if you think like, how many people here know Marshall Rosenberg and nonviolent communication? A good chunk of you. So there was a time before Marshall Rosenberg invented nonviolent communication. And when people got into fights, they just said the nasty thing that came to mind and they said it directly to the person. The other person, what do they do? They said that hurt. And then they said the nasty thing right back. So that's a downward spiral of a kind of win. Like the short term win for me means net bad for the relationship. And then Marshall Rosenberg comes along and says, you know, you might think that that's the only game two people can play when they're in conflict. Like if you just, if that's, if you lived in a world or time before people had figured out that something else was possible, you might think that's the only option. But then he comes along and says, actually, if I name the feeling that I'm having and the technique is you say, I noticed that when you said that, I felt this. You're not saying you did this. You're saying, I noticed that when you said that, I felt this. And then what, you know, what did you feel? And so you keep going back and forth and it's a different protocol. He's like putting in the mimes into an interpersonal conflict. And so I think what we need to be all really good at and what we're kind of exploring is just how do we all get better at being the Marshall Rosenbergs and the mayors of Bogota that invent and transcend the bad game so that we can all play a better game. And I think I, I've personally found helpful. Uh, I used to be just like a pathologically competitive person, uh, which is probably why, you know, poker appealed to me so much because it was just like, oh, I can sit there and get in someone's mind and figure out how to, particularly it was like a boys game and it's like, I can beat the boys at their game. And, uh, and, but it, over, you know, as I matured, I, you know, I could now look back at that old person and be like, wow, she, while I was very good at winning that direct thing, I was not a very happy person. And I was often quite a jealous person. Like if there was someone that I considered a, a sort of a peer or a competitor and they won a tournament that I felt like I should win like that. It was this, you know, like the, the sort of emotions that um, overlap with Moloch are like jealousy, scarcity, um, narrow mindedness. Um, so I was then thinking like, okay, so if Moloch is the, the God of unhealthy competition, lose, lose games, what's the inverse of that? Uh, and the best name I can come up with is, is a god called Win-Win, um, who loves a bit of competition, is, um, you know, it's not like, oh, we must all just be kumbaya, hold hands all the time. Like, yes, that's good. Lots of coordination is probably the best way. But it also allows for spaces of competition in, in a sort of conscious way. You know, we can play a win-lose game as long as we're aware of the externalities and of how we feel in it and our, our, that we are having a good you know as long as everyone's having a good time playing the game and there's no one on the periphery that's getting hurt by our our slinging of, of weapons or whatever um that's okay too so um i don't know i just wanted to put that out there as a thing like think about like oh is, is what i'm doing right now you know is this this you know as i'm trying to raise raise capital here that i want to win at this particular industry just like have those moments of checking in is like is this industry a truly a win-win industry um and it's okay if there's like little pockets of zero sumness but overall is the world better off for that game having been played in the first place i think the ideal form of transforming a game is actually figuring out an entirely new win-win game rather than putting a bottom on the race to the bottom 
but there are different strategies and one a couple other race to the bottom limits are the sabbath uh, if daniel were here in my place he would say one interesting interpretation of why is there a sabbath you know taking one day off completely to you know from work from technology and the fact i think there's something like 29 penalties or something like that if you if you violate the sabbath like why is this such a serious deal and the answer is that if if the work week becomes the place to relatively get your advantage over the other guy versus everybody taking that one day to have Shabbat, to have Sabbath, to have something like that, where we're all stepping back from that narrowness, that that scarcity into a more abundant place. Like it's a different, interp- it's an interesting interpretation of why, where religion is putting a binding of what would otherwise, by, otherwise be a race uh, for that, for winning. One of the other inspiring examples um, from my uh, chief of staff is actually from the 1995 protocol um, to ban blinding laser weapons. So this was actually a time when there was this future technology that people realized was going to be a thing, which is that weapons that if I point a high energy laser at you, it'd be enough to blind you. So we could, this is a really unique time where we all saw this technology and before it was deployed, I think it was the International Commission on Human Rights got together and said, we want to put a ban on that technology before it gets used. And I'm saying that because here we are with AI and we're about to ship all these new godlike powers into the world. And I'm giving a talk tomorrow on the AI dilemma. And if you can come, I highly recommend it. And we're really worried about all these godlike powers that are going to get out there. And one of the things about AI is it moves at a vertical curve because AI makes better AI. Intelligence makes better intelligence. They're literally using intelligence to make faster, they're using AI to, that's built on GPUs from NVIDIA to make and design better chips and GPUs. So the thing is getting faster and faster recursively. And as we have something that's going to move that vertical and that fast, we need to get good at looking ahead at what we don't want to be the bad game that we're caught in. Because we saw what happened with social media. We let it get fully entangled with our society. We let this game perversely screw up children and then create other games where if I choose as an individual kid to not use it, I just lose to the kids that still use it. That's one of the for parents out there, by the way. That's why it's so hard is that as a kid, if I choose to not use Snapchat, I'm just losing out on all the sexual, social gossip, homework being passed around on Snapchat where I'm, I'm out of the game. I'm socially excluded. So we were too late to the party on social media's Moloch dynamic. We're not too late to the party with AI. And what we really need to do is get to be become like a Moloch literate culture that sees this natively. That's how we talk. That's how we talk to each other. So we can slay these Moloch games before they get out of control. Yeah. Um. And just another example as well on like a really big scale. Um, it, I'm not saying that we, you know, shouldn't try and ensure that Moloch is not the force building AI and instead have more of it, you know, be a win-win force building it. Um, but also just to sort of like a thing that gives me a lot of hope because this is obviously a pretty dark topic, right? And um, it's the future will ultimately be built by optimists. And I think it's important to keep that sort of healthy balance, but, um, you know, be realistic about the, the, the nature of the problems that we're facing and how very difficult they are, but also keep optimism alive. Um, I, I was recently just taking a deep dive onto like, uh, the history of nuclear war and proliferation, which is about as mollicky as it gets. Right. Um, but despite these incredible incentives, to keep building more and more nuclear weapons and like bolster your arsenals and all these like technological improvements, which are technically, you know, threaten the, you know, the sort of quasi stable state of mutually assured destruction. Even under all those situations, we managed to build treaties um, and third party organizations like the IAEA um, to help these individual states, which are at loggerheads, coordinate for the greater good and like in some ways like you know we are okay things feel a bit sketchy right now obviously with the russia ukraine war but when i was born back in like 1984 there were 60,000 nuclear weapons on earth 60,000 a few years ago you know the last count basically there were 12,000 which is still a f- fuck ton it's an unacceptable amount but that is a huge improvement which you know from a Moloch perspective, shouldn't really be able to happen because these guys don't trust each other, right? Like, um, they, you know, something made them get to that point, but something also helped them roll it back. So it is possible yeah. to even rectify um, you games that we are already entangled in as well. So we need the sort of a double on pronged approach. But we, I agree with AI, like, and we limited nuclear weapons to nine countries, 
And I want to say there were nuclear scientists who actually committed suicide late, soon after the birth of the atomic bomb because they said, it's over. They would literally, they'd be, there's a story, I think it was a Feynman who was back in the taxi cab or something. He's looking at a bridge being built in New York City in like the 50s or something. And he's like, what's the point? We built nukes. It's all over. Like why? And, and some of those scientists, they committed suicide because they saw the logic of Moloch. So the, the, we're trying to do this weird thing here where we want to train ourselves to point our attention at this thing that I think often makes people feel helpless because it's like, well, how are we ever going to change the game? But we've done it before. We also signed the nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, people don't do above ground uh, nuclear tests. And that comes from human level trust. One of the other famous stories, I know Zach Bell is here. We've um, heard the story, I think, from some people at Esalen. How many people here know Esalen in the California? Of course, at Summit, most people would know Esalen. Most people in the world probably don't know Esalen. Um, where they used to hold these things called track two dialogues. And they had the, um, the KGB and the CIA agents dropping acid in the hot tubs together to create a different way of relating to this thing that they were stewarding, which is the prospect of nuclear war. And how many people here know the film The Day After? Only a few. So this is actually really important. There was this film made in 1983 um, called The Day After, which was a, it was the largest made for TV film event in human history. So 100 million Americans tuned in on primetime television to watch a made for TV movie about what would actually happen if there was a nuclear war. And it followed the course of some families in Kansas and um, you know, who live near the nuclear silos and they hear the, the ringing of the alarms and they see their nuke go off and shoot from the silo. And they, so they know there's like 30 minutes until something happens. This film, at the time, there was this, this shared fate of nuclear annihilation, but humanity didn't really take it seriously. We put it at the back of our mind. The director says we were literally repressing it at the back of our thoughts. And um, he said, what we needed to do is actually bring it from the back to the front so we can actually stare face to face with what we're really dealing with here. And a hundred million Americans tuned in and apparently Reagan saw it. And it was the only, apparently his uh, biographer said he got depressed and cried watching the film. And when Reykjavik happened and Reagan and Gorbachev, because the film was also aired in the Soviet Union four years later, it created a shared image of this is the shared catastrophe that no one fucking wants. And that, uh, the, the guy who was in Reykjavik emailed the director and said, your film had a lot to do with this happening. So that's a really inspiring story that if you can create a new shared reality about an omni lose-lose outcome that no one actually wants, you can change the course of how the game is going. And we need that kind of thinking around all these games, whether you work on health or animal rights or health uh, education or social media or strengthening democracy. What is the Moloch multipolar trap that we're in? And how do we communicate a different game that we can all kind of play? I think we're near time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I, the only thing I'd like to add is like my, my current favorite catchphrase, which is don't hate the players, change the game. Because so much of... Um, you know, particularly with p political polarization, like the fact that we are being told to like blame the enemy. These are the guys causing climate change. These are the guys uh, preventing us, uh, you know, building some terrible new thing. And so on. all the while we do that, it makes it f harder and harder to coordinate. And actually it makes us lose sight of the real enemy here, like which is this Moloch creature. That's why I think the, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I think there's some real wisdom in that story from the Bible, from the Canaanite times. Like th it's the same thing. And I think giving it like a, a sort of a face and a personality makes it easier for people to sort of like point to it. And you know, if we are going to, we need a scapegoat. That is the, the it is the real scapegoat because it's the real enemy. Um, yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much. And yeah. tomorrow we're also, I'm giving this talk on the AI dilemma. If you want to go deep into how AI issues are Highly playing recommend. out in that way, you should come.